Good morning and welcome back. Uh, I had the privilege of welcoming you last night, but I can't miss the opportunity of doing that again, and especially after uh, Professor Simon Margison's uh, brilliant lecture, which I understood kept most of us thinking through much of the night. <laughs> so, uh, with that excitement already there, we have a packed program today. So I'm not going to take your time by uh, speaking, except to say that we really are very, very uh, privileged. We have uh, Dean uh, Robert Pianta, uh, who's, uh, who's co whose school we are with Dean Hosted uh, uh, with us. So I'd, I'd like him to come and say a few words uh, to you. And I also wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, Greg West, who is the Faculty Senate Chairman and who, has been, who was there last night and is again here uh, to support our uh, efforts. Others will come during the day and they will be introduced. But let me briefly <coughs> uh, introduce our own very distinguished Dean Pianta. Robert Pianta is the Dean of the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. The Novartis Professor of Education and Director of UGS Center for advanced study of teaching and learning, Pianta and his research team have developed classroom assessment scoring system, a system to measure classroom quality in preschool through 12th grade. Class, as it is for shorthand, has tested and proven effective in several national studies and is being utilized by every Head Start program in the country. Pianta's work in teacher and classroom quality is nationally recognized. He has extended his work into design and delivery of professional development using web-based formats and interactive video and focuses on teacher quality, teacher-child interaction, and child improvement. Pianta was featured in Malcolm Gladwell's <coughs> article, Most Likely to Succeed, which explores what it takes to identify and develop a successful teacher to compare the process to scouting future professional quarterbacks and citing financial advice. Pianta was asked to provide recommendations for public education to the Obama presidential transition team in the fall of 2008. If we want to improve our students' learning, he recommended good teachers are what we need to improve quality of teachers and of teaching. Research conducted by the Center for Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning at the University shows that only about 30% of teachers really hit the mark in terms of offering students the kind of stimulating challenge and engaging experience that foster learning. So we are truly very, very privileged to have our Pianta as our dean. And this new building is a legacy of his hard work and energy of us. Thank you for that introduction, Gower. I'd like to make uh, clear to everybody that uh, when Malcolm Gladwell's article was titled Most Likely to Succeed, it had nothing to do with me um, <laughs> and, uh, and everything to do with uh, selecting uh, talent elsewhere. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the um, to the Bavaro Hall at the Curry School of Education. Uh, we like to think of this uh, space and this building as um, the most beautiful building for a school of education in the country, and uh, I trust that uh, uh, you'll agree with me a little bit on that and uh, and spend your time uh, wisely and, and well here today. Um, we're really, really pleased uh, to have you join us uh, here today, and it's a, it's a real delight um, to be able to um, share with you many guests uh, guests uh, from outside the university and friends inside of the university to share with you um, this space uh, for the purposes of the conversations that, that are that are going to take place here today. Um, and uh, as a as a dean now in a um, in a school of education in a university that uh, that is looking outward uh, across the globe. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and attention to what uh, is increasingly a critical focus for us and, and the nature and role of the university at a time when uh, global boundaries uh, of all sorts are, are rapidly uh, blurring and disappearing. 
Um, I, I, uh, both in my own work and in my observations uh, of the work of others, um, many of whom you, you will uh, you'll, uh, uh, talk to today, um, we seem to be in this period now where we have this kind of um, intellectual, human, and social capital uh, zipping around the world on all these um, rapidly evolving uh, technological platforms. Um, that that uh, it, you know has created just an entirely different context uh, for how one might think about um, higher education, and that's happening it, again. It seems to me you all know more about this, um, but it seems to me also uh, happening at a time uh, when higher education is taking a place uh, in many cultures and economies around uh, around uh, the world, including our own, uh, as really being viewed as the linchpin of, of economic and. and social uh, success. Putting those two forces together uh, seems to me to be uh, right for uh, uh, at least some attention uh, of, of smart people to conceptualize uh, what the framework is and, and uh, try to identify for those of us that are trying to um, nurture and lead efforts uh, some pathways forward that make sense. Um, so I very much appreciate uh, the, the engagement that you uh, you're all um, Involved with in this particular uh, in this particular topic and effort, I'm really proud of the kinds of things we're doing um, uh, within the Curry School to, um, to to be part of, of these conversations around the globe. Uh, Brian's leadership, Caroline's leadership, Diane Hoffman. We have many uh, faculty uh, uh, involved here that have have strong interests around the globe uh, in various uh, spaces and. and uh, the communities involved with that. We, uh, we've just launched a new website where, where um, part of one of our uh, features of that site is you can click on and see where Curry is involved uh, all across the world. And, and it's, a, it's a very exciting um, possibility for us to think of the ways we not only reach out locally, but we reach out uh, globally with what it is that we do. So um, thank you very, very much for your time and attention um, to, uh, to these matters today. I'll see you uh, in a little while as part of a panel where I will try to at least offer some perspectives um, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from my own work. And uh, I trust uh, that your conversations that take place here today will be, uh, will be fruitful and help us to advance our thinking about this. So thank you all very, very much. And enjoy your day. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dudley Doe, and I direct the International Studies Office at UVA and also the Office of Summer and Special Academic Programs. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome you this, this morning to this seminar. I'm both a Curry alum, and I work in international programs at UVA now. Uh, I want to thank Brian Husser, who has been a very generous mentor to me over the years. <coughs> Curry students and to Curry faculty. <coughs> and one of the ways that uh, he has been an extraordinary contributor to this institution uh, is by introducing us to the work of Simon Martinson, Sheila Slaughter, Imano Ornerica, uh, Erlinda, uh, Erlinda Suarez, Roberto Munoz, Yusiva Lima, and Kevin Kepner. And not only has he introduced us to their work, he has brought them to see us many times over the last 11 years, and we are better for it. Thanks to the Curry School staff for supporting us this, this morning. As you can see, this is a beautiful new facility. It has not, however, offered up all its secrets yet. <laughs> uh, and I will tell you there's been some discovery learning in, in getting everything alive and ready to go this morning. But people have done a wonderful job, and, and we are grateful. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, this is a scarf that uh, was found in the lobby. Um, I will place it right here.
Uh, and if you don't have a folder, there are more outside uh, in the lobby for you to pick up. You'll find a schedule uh, as well as a document that has uh, the bios, short bios of the speakers. Uh, today's sessions are being videotaped. Uh, we will make those videos available on the web uh, soon. Um, Simon's speech from last night, the, uh, the wonderful address he gave in the rotunda, uh, will be posted on the web. Uh, as will any other presentations and remarks that presenters wish to share. The schedule, I think, is pretty straightforward today. We will launch with panel one shortly. We'll have a brief break. Uh, then panel two on balancing local, national, and global missions. Uh, at 12.20, we have UVA buses scheduled to meet us right out front of this building on Emmett Street. They will transport us to the <coughs> Jefferson Scholars Foundation building. Uh, which is a lovely facility, and I know you'll enjoy spending the afternoon there. We'll have lunch there. Sheila Slaughter will deliver her keynote. We will then move to panel three, funding the global university, and finally uh, wrap up with a summation and some closing remarks. The bus will return to Bavaro uh, at 420, and we'll also make a stop at the Cavalier Inn. To my left is Richard Handler, uh, Professor of Anthropology and Director of the New Global Development Studies major at the University. He is the former uh, Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences, a position he held for a decade, 10 years. Um, he has been a great colleague, um, he's a wonderful mind, and uh, we're thrilled to have him uh, chairing this panel this morning. Juliana Guevara. Uh, is the Dean of International Studies at the University of Richmond. Uh, she also holds a chaired professorship at the University of Richmond. And in our field of international <coughs> education, uh, she is uh, legendary, to quote a good colleague of mine who sits here, Marina Marker. Market. And we mean that in the most positive way. Uh, UC Balima, uh, from the University of Uvascula in Finland, is a professor of higher education. Uh, he also has uh, been a visiting professor at USC uh, in California, <coughs> Penn State, and uh, Hiroshima University. To his left is our own Carol Ann Screen. Uh, she is a professor of education at UVA uh, with a particular interest in comparative education and international education policy, and has been doing work in South Africa for many years now. And finally, we have Elinda Suarez from UNAM in Mexico. Uh, she's a political scientist and a senior faculty researcher at uh, UNAM in, in Mexico. Thank you very much, and enjoy the day. Okay, well, uh, welcome. Uh, very highly ritualized introduction. We have three introductions. Um, so, that's what the would say. Um, let me just tell you, we weren't quite sure how to proceed with this panel, uh, and uh, so I wrote up uh, a few remarks that might take me eight to ten minutes to read, and then other people decided that they might write some things or not. So, we'll go down the line and see who has what to say, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Um, I knew the panel was about global citizens, or the panel is called Preparing Global Citizens. So uh, this is what came into my head um, when I wrote my introductory remarks. Let me begin with what anthropologists call a native definition of a citizen. If you ask me, the native, I'd say a citizen is a member of a nation state. If pressed to elaborate, I'd add that a citizen is a person who is duly recognized as belonging to a recognized nation state. Such recognition operates internally and externally, which is to say a citizen is a person holding a valid driver's license and a valid passport. Starting from such a definition, the notion of a, lo of a global citizen doesn't make much sense. Citizenship is about particularity, locality, political identity defined in terms of a delimited territory. Uh, the, ter the term global, on the other hand, denotes the whole world, as we might have said when we were children. Indeed, the term global rubs up against the term universal, which is the very opposite of the particular, the local, and the territorially bounded. So, it would seem that a global citizen is something of a unicorn. 
an imaginary being which cannot exist in what we sometimes call the real world. And yet in the current jargon of higher education, phrases like global citizen are in the air, or more particularly on the lips of those, with charge, uh, those who are charged with burnishing institutional images, currying donations from international business elites, and maintaining websites. I recall one definition of the term in which the global citizen uh, an institution aims to produce is said to be a person who speaks several languages, who crosses uh, cultural and national borders easily, and who can feel at home or at least learn to get along in a culturally sensitive manner anywhere in the world. This, of course, is a fantasy. But it's a fantasy with a particular kind of socioeconomic location. It's a fantasy, moreover, which is rooted in modern notions of what a person is. To understand such modern ideas, I turn very briefly to one of my favorite passages uh, from Alexei de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Uh, the name of Tocqueville's game is to compare hierarchical societies, which he called aristocracies, to individualistic egalitarian ones, which he called democracies. In a hierarchical society, the individual does not exist as a standalone unit, since every individual is part of the social whole and linked in specific relations of superordination and subordination to persons above and below. Moreover, in hierarchical societies, individuals are not understood to be alike in the sense of sharing a common humanity. There's no vision of a common humanity, not much of it. Since persons at different social levels are conceived to be different kinds of creatures, the peasant and the king not to mention the angel, are simply not equally human in these kinds of worlds. In democracies, by contrast, each individual is understood to be a center of autonomous agency, equal in principle to all other individuals, and in fundamental respects like those others, since all are equally human. As we say in the United States, anyone can grow up to be president. But watch out for the Tea Party. We know, of course, where our preferences lie, since all of us who are educated in the school systems of democracy, of a democracy, know that hierarchy and ins inherited status are backwards and bad, whereas freedom and equality are modern and good. But Tocqueville, uh, writing in 1840, was able to see the strengths and weaknesses of both systems by juxtaposing one against the other. And the following comparative observation is particularly apt for our consideration of the idea of global citizenship. In aristocracies, according to Tocqueville, pe people are linked tightly to those above and below. That is, as he puts it, they are almost always closely attached to someone placed out of their own sphere. As a consequence, he says, they are disposed to forget themselves because the self <coughs> in this world is not the primary reality. Democratic societies, on the other hand, are atomistic. Equivalent individuals live side by side without much social connection one to the other. We don't know our next door neighbors. But they believe that all people everywhere are alike. The contrast between these social formations plays out strikingly in attitudes towards global citizenship. And here I take a, a longer quotation from Tokyo. He says, in aristocratic ages, the, the notion of human fellowship is faint and men seldom think of sac sacrificing themselves for mankind, but they often sacrifice themselves for other men. In democratic times, on the contrary, when the duties of each individual to the race are much clearer, that is, there's an idea of common humanity. In that case, he says, devoted service to any one man becomes rarer. The bond of human affection is extended to all, but is relaxed. Now, to me, this passage describes one version of global citizenship that is quite common in the United States and quite visible on college campuses. We were ready to help, to pitch in to help people far away, usually by anonymously giving money, that universal medium of exchange, through a bureaucratic organization to people we will never know. But if you watch, watch us walk our own city streets, skirting with embarrassment and furtive, furtive looks, the beggars on our sidewalks, you will see that we avoid, like the plague, personal connections to people who need our help. We'll engage in a bizarre ritual, like biking for Uganda, to, to demonstrate our common humanity, but we have no interest in making common cause in a socially sustained and continuous way with particular poor people in our own communities who might need our help and some of our resources. And to generalize from this example, the modern idea of a generic human being 
or of all mankind, all humankind, to whom we are connected in good faith, is a peculiar one. It is not obviously the case that any one of us should be able to go anywhere in the world and relate instantly to other people, simply on the grounds that we're all human. After all, what makes us human, anthropologists teach, is precisely what makes us differ from other people, our particular histories and cultures. And even if we have what we think are cultural skills, it's a fantasy to think we can make deep or meaningful or even practical social connections to other people in an instant. It usually takes a while to become a part of someone else's community, and even more time if we wish to know how to work with them to help them achieve goals that they themselves think are important. Finally, the idea of a global citizen is not only fictional in its implications of a kind of instant rapport, it is deeply deluded, self-mystified, we might say, in its, in its inattention to the privileged social position of those who aspire to be global citizens. When universities, for example, talk about producing multilingual global citizens who can cross all cultural boundaries, they forget that such Im imagery pre presupposes the existence of the benighted natives who, too poor to travel, stay home, where they can non nonetheless live as culturally authentic monolingual locals whom we can visit and connect to as we choose. Global citizenship is really about the assumed rights of so socioeconomically privileged white people to travel anywhere in the world they wish to visit and or to help darker skinned people. After all, in American popular discourse are illegal Mexican immigrants global citizens. Those are my remarks. I'll turn it over to the person on my left. Thank you. It's in the audience turn. I will stand simply because it feels more comfortable to speak while standing um, with prepared remarks. <coughs> I also um, want to thank Professor Morrison for uh, his remarks yesterday, but also for teaching me a lesson about using the visual. I, um, as you will see, do not have a PowerPoint, but his particular use of uh, images was inspiring. So beware, don't come to my next presentation. <laughs> um, a few days ago, we had a large delegation of top university administrators from uh, a number of important institutions in an important Asian country visiting the University of Richmond. Their goal was to learn about such things as strategic planning, financial structures of a university, fundraising, admissions in a competitive environment, internationalization, and academic structures too. But observing the event was an excellent demonstration of profound and persistent cultural differences and how they affect everything we do. I wish I had some students observe through a one-way mirror, you know, the kind that you see on Law and Order. American speakers, almost without exception, began with the obligatory ice-breaking joke, which got no response from the visitors. <laughs> and almost all speakers had PowerPoint presentations on the screen, which received no attention from the visitors, who, having very limited English, focused their gaze on the surface in front of them, where, among other things, they probably had translations of the PowerPoint. For American speakers, so focused on making connection with their audience, this was, of course, a challenging moment. I offer this vignette uh, both as a cautionary tale as we speak about the global world, and as a justification for starting in media res and not having a problem. So what follows um, is a case study rather than a theoretical approach to the issue but I hope one which has some impl larger implications. So let me begin uh, the way uh, Richard had. What does it take to be an American citizen? Most of us are tempted to say it takes uh, voting and paying taxes. Uh, but of course, all it takes is being born here. I dare say Richard's definition would exclude a very significant portion of the American citizenry, and I'm not sure they would be amused. Of course, um, yeah, that birth on, in America is all it takes to be an American citizen, and only, only service in the military of a, uh, another country would cause, could cause you, could cause you to lose your citizenship. 
So what about global citizenship? One way to answer this question, and a pragmatic one, is to say that in today's world, we have no choice in the matter. We are, willy-nilly, global citizens. Yes, even the members of the two parties. Global warming affects all of us, no matter whether we believe in it or not, are informed about it or blissfully ignorant. An outbreak of the swine flu last year, had it materialized, would have affected all of us. Um, we did, of course, the great plague of the flu in 1917. Uh, so we've not invented anything new. Um, so you wouldn't have to travel internationally to get rid of the swine flu. And the price of rice in China, that proverbial um, um, way of talking about something irrelevant. So the price of rice in China and of cotton in India will affect all of us. There are, in fact, already warnings on NPR, no less, uh, about the fact that if you would like to buy uh, somebody a uh, Christmas present that is made of cotton, you better rush out to the store because there will be a shortage of cotton material materials the manufacturers turning to less expensive uh, stuff. On immigration, you don't have to live in Arizona to be affected by it or to think about it. So as in the case of an American citizen, I would say you can do good, better, best, bad, or mediocre. And I would suggest that that is a framework in which we, we may want to vote. So let me offer you a few portraits, snapshots, not the portraits. Will Craven, class of 09, majored at Richmond in International Studies, one month ago Will appeared on the pages of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, a number of other publications, because he and his staff of the International Medical Corps were first to respond to the horrendous rapes of 200 plus women in northeastern Congo. Will is affected in this work because he has spent a significant amount of time in various countries uh, of Africa as an undergraduate and is fluent in Swahili. Last week, Will connected via Skype with some 50 University of Richmond students to whom he spoke about the situation in the Congo, his work, and um, how they could follow in his footsteps. Adnan Hajizada, a uh, class of 05, came to Richmond from Azerbaijan. He majored in political science and was very active in various student organizations <laughs> and later returned to Baku. He's now in prison, convicted of, for hooliganism, because he and his friends had started um, a, something called an Azerbaijani youth movement. Um, they're superb bloggers, and they published on YouTube a performance piece in which dressed in donkey suits, they talked about the government spending large amounts of money to import donkeys from Germany. His father tells us that Adnan learned about the responsibilities of citizenship and the right to free speech here at Richmond. Fiona Ellis, class of 07, majored in French and rhetoric and communication, eager to explore the world of international development, she volunteered for the Manda Wilderness Community Trust and the Wilderness uh, Agricultural Project in northern Mozambique. The organizations operate an uh, ecotourism destination designed to bring tourists to remote parts of Africa where benefiting the surrounding communities by improving their health, education, and the conditions as they go. Sofia Jolanizada, class of 10, so she's not graduated yet, um, is in accounting. Sofia is from Kabul. She already was offered a job as a staff accountant with a US government contractor performing construction in, um, uh, and consulting in Afghanistan. Brett Wigdorf, class of uh, 95, majored in the world politics and diplomacy. He's a native of New Jersey. After working for McKinsey, um, he and in Southeast Asia, he created something t uh, called Teach First in London, a better version, I dare say, of Teach for America, uh, recognized very widely uh, in, in the UK, uh, which involves students from such um, uh, in universities as Oxford and Cambridge in teaching in the most um, problematic uh, schools in inner cities. Finally, Vera Mascarenhas, class of 02, 
majored in economics and English literature, went to <laughs> Columbia Law School, uh, clerked at the International Court in The Hague, and uh, then was legal officer for the UN War Crimes Tribunal in Sierra Leone, currently works for an international law mm -hmm. in, in um, New York. I could, of course, uh, multiply those uh, little snapshots. You could actually see them, this and a great deal more, if I had known about better uses of uh, the visual, uh, on our website www.international.richmond.edu. I hope you will, you will click on it. So what are the characteristics of these Richmond alumni? Two are Americans, born and bred, one of them living the life of an expatriate in um, London. One is Indian, another is Aryan, another Afghani. They majored in a variety of disciplines. But they all studied abroad, multiple times usually, and not one of them is monolingual. Swahili, French, Pashto, Ugebovic. They all had the experience of living and studying in at least two countries and cultures, and all chose to become involved in work that addresses important social problems, whether it is their own native um, society or another one. It's very interesting. Um, a recent article entitled Cultural Borders and Mental Barriers, the Relationship Between Living Abroad and Creativity, uh, William Maddox and Alan Galinsky, Northwestern University, published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, presents empirical evidence from five studies that systematically explored the relationship between living abroad and creativity. The results were consistent. Those who had lived abroad were more successful in creative problem-solving tasks, very real, very reproducible. To demonstrate the solidity of the living abroad creativity link, Galinsky and his colleagues tested their ideas across several studies in the United States and in Europe, measuring creativity using standard psychological tests as well as real-world sources such as entrepreneurial ventures and product innovation. Research results showed no correlation, either positive or negative, travel abroad, but did show a positive correlation with study abroad of some significant length. In interpreting the link between living abroad and creativity, Galinsky and his colleagues point to the ways in which multicultural experience disrupts routine knowledge and problematizes it while uh, it gives one access to new ideas, new ways of interpreting reality, new ways of being. Anyone who works and studies abroad and has spoken to students returning from abroad will probably agree that um, before even speaking about the country in which they uh, study, students focus on how much they learn about themselves and about the U.S. Developing an, abil an ability to identify simultaneously with the home and host cultures that results in positive impact on creativity as well as entrepreneurial innovation are the conclusions um, of Galinsky and his colleagues. So I dare say we can conclude that there's a kind of mutuality between uh, globalization and creativity. <coughs> globalization um, uh, drives creativity, and creativity drives globalization. An interesting circularity. But in none of these studies is there a suggestion that living uh, uh, or studying abroad results in a commitment to work which addresses societal problems. What then do the stories of these five Richmond alumni tell us about the relationship between the education we offer students and global citizenship? I should correct this and say, what is the relationship between positive, good global citizenship and the education we construct together with our students? This brings me back to the University of Richmond, a small 3,500 students institution composed of five schools, the arts and sciences, business, leadership, law, the only graduate program, and continuing studies. The heart and essence of the university is its focus on liberal education, which has traditionally and insistently embraced a wide range of knowledge, including knowledge for its own sake, and a commitment to purposeful working knowledge. Liberal education has, for example, traditionally included and stressed education for good citizenship as well as the education of a complete, complex individual. 
To illustrate the evolution of the university, which I believe demonstrates the transformation of higher education in the last 20 years, at its best, I hope, let me focus on what aspects of it, which, uh, on one aspect of it, which is of particular interest to us today, international education. Or better put, the internationalization of the institution. When I was asked to create the Office of International Education 22 years ago, we had some half dozen international students and about a dozen students who ventured abroad. Now, international students constitute 9% of the student population and some 60% of undergraduates study abroad. Very importantly, among the faculty, there are very many people who were born, lived, worked, and um, done research all around the world. Why and how did we get from there to here? The answer to the why must begin with a group of faculty who understood in the 80s that excellence in education is no longer compatible with a provincial institutional identity. Out of this conviction grew both the creation of the office and an institutionally funded faculty seminar abroad whose goal was to re-educate uh, people who had neither knowledge nor experience of the world. Not people in specific disciplines, not specialists in their, uh, area studies but anyone and everyone who understood and, uh, that, and was prepared to join a new educational imperative of preparing students for a very different world than the one for which they had been trained and which they understood in a and, and the creation of a multidisciplinary intellectual community that, um, uh, in the faculty. And that is what the seminar has been um, contributed to over the 20 years. Internationalization at Richmond has been based in what we call a comprehensive and integrated approach. Study abroad international students, curriculum internationalization, and faculty development, as well as service learning, languages and literatures across the curriculum, are all parts of that evolving institutional culture. We believe that the presence of students from more than 70 countries around the world enriches the learning and lives of all students, both in and out of the classroom. And that is why we have committed ourselves to offering financial aid, both merit and need-based, to international students. We have also concluded that in the 21st century, study abroad should be an integral part of enrichment education. And therefore, we need to create access to semester study abroad, regardless of the student's financial status, so all financial, institutional financial aid uh, is applicable and we offer a travel stipend, pay for passports and visas, etc. And that it should be available to anyone in any major. And in order to make that possible, we have signed agreements with more than 60 universities around the world. So a chemistry student can go and study chemistry at Melbourne, for example, where there are more chemists and more uh, courses than uh, our institution can possibly happen. Have, and of course, a great deal more happens there. This is also true mm -hmm. for other majors, and so our students can go to Chile and Argentina, Brazil, and China. And um, the preparation for study abroad begins on campus in the interaction with international students and faculty, in the courses with international content, <coughs> in the work students do in the increasingly international community in which the university is located. So international education is not synonymous with study abroad, rather it is com the combined result of what is happening on campus before it, what happens abroad, and what happens on campus among students in return. It is important to note that in a time when globalization of higher education is happening all around the world, and English is increasing in the lingua franca, our students, yours and mine, do not have become completely fluent in French, Chinese, or um, uh, Italian to be able to go and, and study in the countries where the language is spoken because there are some courses in English created with local students in mind um, which they can take while they continue developing their linguistic facility. My new kit is on the glory and beauty of speaking foreign languages badly. I think that's very important. I will be glad to explain. So, um, our students go and study abroad. The resulting boost to their creativity 
as much as new academic knowledge and cross-cultural skills make these students more employable, <laughs> yes, um, and we believe better global citizens, giving them a real um, sense of belonging in the world. The October dedication of the Carol Weinstein International Center at 21,057,000 square foot academic building is both a symbol of institutional commitment to internationalization and an important demonstration of the complexity of what we are undertaking. At a time when liberal education and the humanities seem to be under assault uh, for, as a result of economic contingencies, at least that's what we are told, uh, we have two departments of literatures, cultures, and languages in the, in the new building, geography, international law, four interdisciplinary programs, ESL, uh, cultures and literatures across the curriculum, and the Office of International Education. <coughs> but the center is designed to serve all schools and all departments on campus, and part of its agenda is to use um, new cutting-edge technology to expand collaborative teaching and research involving our faculty and students and faculty and students uh, partner institutions. Across from the beautiful Center for International um, Education is the new football stadium. And uh, we are about to complete an expansion of the business school. I say this because I believe that global education and an education for global citizenship must encompass um, a liberal education as well as business leadership and possibly football as well. <laughs> And I think that that, that is 
important to, to remember because, because we human beings live in our local communities. And it seems that, that our, the, the social ties that we have uh, in our local communities and the local experiences are something which is quite easy to, to see and understand. Whereas uh, what seems to be happening uh, is that the, the, the definition or understanding of, of national is being redefined. Not only in, in Europe, but being part of the European Union, uh, uh, which, is, which is quite familiar to me, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's being re redefined globally. And I would, I would say that, that uh, maybe national is, is becoming more like an uh, abstract concept, concept which is not necessarily any more uh, structuring social experiences of, of human lives. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, what I, I'm, actually I'm, I'm not here interested in, in, in uh, trying to define what is a global citizen. Uh, but here I'd like to hear in the, the, in the, in the intellectual home of pragmatism, I'd like to ask <coughs> what do the, the global citizens need and what the global citizens needs to, needs to be able to do. Uh, I was born in, in, in 1950s in a world which was quite easily uh, explained that, uh, thanks to, to Karl Marx. Especially. It was easy to understand the development of societies uh, using the Hegelian philosophy of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, uh, and replacing the basis with, it, uh, with social classes. It was easy to, to locate oneself in society, in a certain class, uh, and identify oneself as part of the social class, which is, is part of the society constructed from the classes. And as research categories, these social classes were, were also very handy, and, and, and some people still use them. Because then you would explain how the society works. Uh, well, actually, this has been criticized as methodological nationalism, but, but in a way, it, it, uh, it also, uh, it, through these uh, intellectual devices, it helped to, to, to define nation state as a normal category for human beings. And it was also easy, easy uh, to, to use this in cultural terms because everybody knew that capitalism was bad and water was good, or the workers were bad and the capitalists were, were good. So life was pretty easy <laughs> in that way. Uh, but what is the problem now is, is that, is that uh, these old categories like uh, uh, labor versus capital, uh, communism versus uh, capitalism, free society versus uh, totalitarian society, they are, they are losing or they have lost their exploratory power, uh, especially in the context of local experience, in the, in the context of, of human, human life. Uh, what we have, instead of, of this, this, uh, this grand previous uh, traditional grand social theories, we have theories of globalization, theories of knowledge society, uh, theories of network society. And these, for me, these are more like analytical categories, which are both too complex and too simple to be used for understanding local experiences. Uh, what I mean by too complex? Well, by, by too complex, I, I mean that uh, in addition to that, that the traditional categories do not work anymore, uh, they are no clear dichotomies like social class, uh, capital versus labor, etc., which could be used to explain what we see and feel happening in our society, in our environment. Uh, and they are too simple because the concepts like knowledge society, knowledge economy, networks, network society, globalization, they are uh, not only academic concepts, but they are also common language terms. They are too weak to be used as exploratory categories or as uh, rigorous academic intellectual devices. Uh, because basically they say that uh, knowledge is used everywhere and needed everywhere in society and economy. 
or that people live in networks, or that globalization is everywhere and it influences everywhere all over the globe. So, what, what can we do with that kind of uh, understanding of, of the world? But yet, these, these conceptualizations, they are helpful intellectual devices which challenge us academic, as academics to try to oper uh, operationalize these broad concepts into practical research questions which can be examined and added. And this I see is, 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 uh, is, is uh, the, the problem with this, this, this uh, uh, emerging uh, grand source of theories. So, this is more like an introduction. So what does this, this new situation require from higher education institutions? What are the challenges that we, we should face when, uh, when we are trying to educate our citizens? Uh, I think that there are two main challenges. First, uh, we, we should be able to educate people, citizens, who are able to understand the nature of global changes taking place and who are able to live as citizens in their local communities without losing hope or their ability to act. Uh, what would, it, would this require in more practical terms from my guess institutions? Well, I, this is what I'm, I'm suggesting. First, uh, we should uh, make our, our students or our citizens uh, be able to to learning with, uh, with uncertainty. Uh, if you think historically, living in an uncertain, unpredictable world, uh, this is nothing new. This is the, the, the normal human condition before the area of industri industrialization. Because during this, this, this short period, about 100 years, uh, we, it was, uh, we, we, uh, we developed uh, uh, devices to, to to predict and control our environment. But now when we are living in a post-industrial world, I would say that this uncertainty is coming back. We are no longer able to, to see, uh, to, to predict what is happening in the real world. Uh, this, uh, uh, facing this challenge, I think it, 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 it also requires taking seriously theoretical attempts to explain society. Despite the fact that I, I criticize the, the present social theories, I think that they are the best, that, uh, well, maybe the best that we are having today. And we have a theory, we need to uh, uh, create theoretical understanding which will help our uh, global citizens to understand the, the big picture, the, the social forces, the social dynamics that, that, are, that are shaping our world. Uh, because this, in a positive way, this can help people to see, uh, to see uh, how these social forces, these social dynamics influence their normal lives. It helps to, to citizens to have a perspective into their lives, uh, into society and global world. So it increases, I hopefully, social, uh, global sensitiveness. And uh, and, what would the, and, and translated in the university education, it means that uh, we should uh, uh, we, we should uh, try to educate citizens who are theoretically sensitive and practically competent, not only in terms of generic skills like analytical reasoning, critical thinking, etc., but also in terms of taking seriously one's individual development as human beings, as global citizens, and here I'm making reference to the whole idea of the idea uh, uh, promoted by the Cambodian universities. And one, and the fourth point is, is that uh, lifelong learning, I think, is, is becoming more crucial in a rapidly changing global world. Uh, what is a crucial skill in, 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 in lifelong life learning is the ability to learn how to learn. And, and lifelong learning, I think, is, is easy, too easily uh, understood as, as updating one's skills to be, to be able to, to re-enter re or in, in, uh, in the labor market. 
But I, I would like to, to emphasize the, the need for, for more humanistic understanding of, of life and learning. Uh, because if we see from, from this perspective that human capital uh, it's not, it should not be understood as a private good. It should be understood as a capacity of society to adapt to changes and increase uh, citizens' capacities uh, for public good rather than, than individual interest. In this is getting through education. So, and what would this kind of uh, university look like if, uh, if all, all this comes true? I would like to say that this is this would, uh, the, the university idea would be something like humble university global actual hub. Uh, and this hub university would be able to educate globally competent citizens instead of trying to create uh, global citizens. Thank you very much. Well, we, that was a marvelous acronym with which we, with which we ended. Hi. I think that'll haunt the rest of the conference. Yeah. Carol Ann? I'm going to take liberty to, uh, since I was, I was invited this weekend to give this paper, so I um, basically have a semi-structured talk, and it's not as theoretically coherent as some of my colleagues, but um, I'm going to sit here because I'm Italian and I tend to wave my arms and pace all over the place, so this will contain me. <laughs>
It's really important to talk about how globalization differentially impacts people and communities around the world and higher education specific role within that. And we tend to kind of think of it as a very um, benevolent endeavor, but it also is a very deleterious project too. And I think that's important to put on the table. Um, so, you know, I believe global systems as they exist through higher education help perpetuate inequality through power and privilege over what knowledge is valued and recognized, through ideas of competition and capitalism, through, through economic systems and structures. Um, for me to understand globalization in higher education really requires that young people understand how, what they do in this world and, and how this affects the lives of other people. And, I, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the code pedagogy around that. I have four basic <coughs> ideas that I wanted to share today. Um, and the first is this notion of globalization as it stretches our foundations of knowledge. So let's get that other forms of knowing and being. So as technology connects us and brings us to different places around the world, how do we take that into universities? And I think somebody last night at dinner said, oh, well, 98% of the faculty would agree with everything Simon said about the space of, and I kind of went, hmm, universities are not fundamentally about change. <laughs> and they're not fundamentally about looking at other forms of knowledge. And they're not fundamentally about breaking down these barriers. We're about, we've colonized the space, we're going to own it, and we're going to take, you know, this is our thing. We're not about trying to open up and challenge the way we think about the world. And we're, we're set up very specifically to do that. So I want to talk about that a little bit. The second thing I want to talk about is we're in this age of accountability, and particularly in America. And I think for those of you who are visiting here from overseas, it's really, really important to understand how we're viewing higher education under this new kind of measuring outcomes. What's the value added? What are we doing? We are in an identity crisis of do we make a difference? That's the backdrop with which every decision that we make about educational planning is made. And we tend to, and this is a global thing too, but We've embraced this in the United States, and faculty have embraced it. And I think that's something that's different. There's a big pushback in other institutions around the world challenging these notions of accountability. We've just kind of said, how do we get, how do we make sure we do it the best instead of challenging these ideas about we're going to measure learning outcomes and we're going to look at what difference that we've made. And I think that's important to discuss as well. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is what does it mean to be a global citizen? And this is kind of what um, Lucy was talking about. But looking at the idea of a citizen versus, versus somebody who is globally competent, or we, we, talk, we tend to, in this country, talk about global competency. So what are the skills we need to develop? What do we need to do to be more globally competitive? But I think it's important, Richard, to, to go back to this idea of what is a citizen? What are our obligations to think of social responsibility? And I think Lucy was laying out some really interesting ideas around that that I want to play with. Um, and the last is, if I have time, I don't know, um, is speaking from the perspective of an, of an education school. Um, we have, we're mostly higher ed and administration, but really it starts much younger than universities. And so I just want to put that on the table too. All right, so, so my first area to talk about was this idea of foundations of knowledge. So within higher education, all of our investment in identity is discipline-based. Our rewards, our incentives for promotion, our ideas about self and ownership of ideas. Um, we're not collaborative. When you co-author things, you don't get as much credit for it, right? When you work with people around the world, it's kind of seen as you're on some kind of boondoggle, right? And I think it's really important to think about the kinds of rewards and incentives that are put into place around publishing um, are very English-oriented, very American, northern perspectives about what counts as important knowledge, what is value. Now we're talking about the high-impact peer-reviewed journals, and we're talking about an English-only world. And if we're talking about globalization, we're talking about other ways of seeing and knowing and doing and being and respecting, it's really got to change that. And, and that's a fundamental structural thing that we don't tend to talk about. We say, oh, well, we're, we're going to publish our articles over here, but we're going to talk about indigenous voices. But, but it's really not about changing the way that that information is put out there and it's shared. Um, Globalization requires that we recognize others in four-fifths, the other four-fifths of the rest of the world and the way that the people there do things. Um, we need a fundamental restructuring of teaching and learning in higher education. And I think, um, you know, in the next 15 or 20 years, we're talking about global, significant global changes in terms of, you know, um, 
political violence, in terms of climate change, in terms of the way that we're restructuring the, the, the political order in the world. Um, and you know, this idea, and, and Bob and I talk about this a lot in class, real world problems know no disciplinary boundaries. So it's not sufficient anymore to talk about medicine in a really limited, narrow way. It's thinking about the relationship between society and medicine, and relationships between different disciplines. Um, I, I was, Friday night, I was listening to National Public Radio, and they had the new NSF director. Did anybody hear that? He was, he was um, he's from India, and he was talking about um, science and society are intimately inter interconnected, and we can't think in different spaces about them anymore. And we've got to find ways to bridge this information and the way that we learn to do things. And yet, when you think about how universities are structured and organized, we don't work in ways that bridge these things. And it's because of the incentive systems, but it's also what we feel comfortable with and how we do things. Um, he talked about, he argued for interdisciplinary approaches to solving problems. Um, and then he talked about how funding structures privilege some voices and some kinds of research over others, the, the vast amounts of money that are put into applied sciences versus social sciences. And, you know, there's not a lot out there that um, encourages people to work together. Um, and he talked about the great inequity and in distribution of resources within the academy, so even within institutions, not just outside of institutions. Um, this, so I'll uh, just put those out there. The second area I was really thinking about was this idea of global citizenship and competency. So coming from outside the U.S., there's this imperative to understand these fundamental market concepts and how edu higher education is managed here. Um, you know, the language here is largely based on this very instrumentalist idea linked to competition. We had um, Mark Warner, the former governor, governor of Virginia, who was here at, at Curry School about a month ago, and he talked about globalization, and I thought, oh, this is great, he's talking about international education. And his whole thing was, China and India are going to get us if we don't do this, and we've got to make sure that we get our standards up, and we want every single kid in the state of Virginia to be more competitive globally. And I thought, we're in a financial crisis. People are melting down. Families are you know, falling apart. And we're not talking at all about human values. We're worrying about China and India. And we're not caring about the kid, things that kids are going through. Right here in Charlottesville, we have a poverty rate of 40%. 40% of kids live in, in below the poverty level in this community. You would not know that walking through this building. You know, and we don't talk about that. We are, we're worried about China and Japan. Well, not Japan anymore. That's 20 years ago. That was our last threat. <laughs> but, but really, thinking about what this world is and what our responsibilities are and how we relate to each other is not part of how we talk about globalization. Um, Fernando Reimer, um, who's at Harvard, has written a whole bunch recently in um, the Chronicle and a lot of um, talks about global, global education. But he talks about hard and soft skills. And I think this is kind of where, where um, Lucy was speaking. The hard skills, he talks about disciplinary knowledge and complex fields like political science, economics, history, literature. Um, but he also talks about language skills. And that your introduction in multiple languages points to the fact that we in this country do not care about language. It's not a value. And in fact, when we do have opportunities to have kids who are actually bilingual, it's all about transitional English. Make kids more successful within an American system. Let's get them through. And it doesn't value their culture, their, you know, their diversity. It doesn't provide dignity for other ways of knowing and doing and being. And this is an untapped resource in our universities, but in our K-12 system as well. We have incredible resources from around the world here that just become homogenized or um, basically integrated into the American system that does not serve us well or those students well. Um, another thing he talks about is deep knowledge and understanding of world history, geography, and global dimensions. Americans always are way behind the rest of the world in their geographic knowledge and in their understanding of world politics. Um, then he talks about soft skills and this idea of knowledge and dispositions, right? This openness, um, interest in, in um, having a positive disposition towards other people, tolerance towards cultural differences, recognition and being able to negotiate across different contexts. Now these are the things that are really, I think, the nuts and bolts of being a global citizen. But why don't we value those things? We can't measure them. 
they're really hard to measure. So in our age of accountability and the way that universities have to prove they're doing something, when you want to talk about knowledge and respect, Lauren, where's Lauren? Lauren's my doctoral student. Okay, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren um, is trying to measure the impact of civic engagement and study abroad on students. And you can't just do it from a survey. She'll tell you. <laughs> you have to understand how they're using this. What are they doing? How do they negotiate? And you don't, it's not, you can't do a survey to do that. So administrators aren't interested in it. But yet this is what we're really talking about. It's dispositions towards the world and understanding your place and role and responsibility in it. Um, sorry, I'm going to skip to my third. The, what is the value added of higher education? So to go back to Simon's point of higher education as a public good. And here in this university, we talk a lot about community engagement. That's our public good. So we're going to go and we're going to volunteer at Madison House. We're going to go fix the poor community. We're gonna, but it's always from on high. We have this idea that um, we're going to stand where we are, but we're not, we don't have to change who we are and reflect on what we do in those positions. So thinking about what universities can and do, and how do they relate very differently to thinking about the community is something that this university is really struggling with and thinking about. There's a lot of conversations going on here about how do we relate to and work with the community in more purposeful and respectful ways that aren't just about going out to do something. Because we do have this very, again, instrumentalist approach to working within the community and serving the community. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important to think about the investment in higher education in terms of per people expenditure, right? Um, if we look at what we're spending on each individual person versus, um, and the individual gains that they receive as a result of that versus, what are, is the benefit to the society or to the community? How does, how does the investment per person that we're making in students here benefit the greater society? And that's going to be the real question in terms of thinking about the public good of higher education. How is this impacting change and different kinds of relationships and ways that people respect and work together? Um, my, last, my last point. Oh, one thing I, I want to also put out there is there, there are a number of people around the country that are thinking about this and looking at this. Um, there's organizations like the Asian Society, the Longwood Foundation, there's partnerships for 21st century schools, there's the business roundtables. Now again, you have to think about what their definitions are of globalization and of citizenship and what is the in impetus behind these different movements. But there is a, a, a push to think about global competencies and global awareness. But my, my request or call to all of us is to think about ways of challenging that so those ideas become much more purposeful and intentional and, and really bring in a global citizenship. I'm like, Richard was, I mean, I guess as Richard was raising, that isn't just about privileging um, American students to travel around the world or, or privileging the, the structures that exist, but actually to change those structures and think differently about how to educate people. And that requires a fundamental transformation about how our higher education is structured. I'll leave it there. Okay. Hi. Hola. Hola. Well, I, I come from Mexico, and uh, well, I, I know you know my context because Mexico is very near for. Well, oh, I hope you know. <laughs> Well, first thing I want to say is that I prepared a very formal paper. And when I come here, I knew I, I don't want to. To be global is to talk. So the first thing I want to say is that I try to understand what Simon says yesterday, said yesterday, and to hear and attend all what you say, and try to make my own, own, my own points from yours. So, I'm going to say, first thing, the first thing is that when we are talking about citizens, we are talking about human beings with ethical and political rights and duties. Now, thus, to develop citizenship in 
and from our universities. First, we have to be successful. And I don't know <coughs> who we are. I mean, we are doing our duties and responsibilities. The first step we have to take also is to debate about values and actions. If we don't do this, what we will be doing when moving our universities to be global, whatever it means, is to increase the gap between our stated <coughs> values and our practices. With such a starting gap, how could it be possible for any higher education institution to contribute to prepare citizens? Name it local or not. The second thing I, I am moving paper and over because this morning. Classification of universities is used not only in the study of higher education to describe institutional diversity, but to produce and reproduce hierarchies that ensure different places and representations for institutions and individuals. The point to stress here is that placing global university as a superstar in the academic scenario um, is an ideal weapon for social distinction and kind of following peer motivation. This represents a driving force which divides the world into superior, let me say, those who speak English, and inferior, the other cultures. Here, my question is, from an ethical point of view, what will be the consequences of making distinctions between global citizens and any other kind of citizens? It is possible to have first-class citizens and second? I, I only want to say you something, to share with you some of my data, my uh, research field is um, young people, I, I study dark hairs and all these kind of tribes in the world. And uh, Mexico is a Spanish speaking country. Within total population of college students, only 35% are English speakers. In the private <coughs> Mexican universities, this percentage reaches 42%. As we can see, most Mexican college students do not represent the perfect candidate or candidate for my communication for studying in global universities. But when asking them if they would like to do so, most of them answer affirmatively, independent of their English speaking capacity. What here appears is that nowadays, for many Mexican college students, the sense of needing to belong and establish relationship, relationships with the so-called global society is turning critical. In the present time of Mexico, the discourses of global universities have produced the need to take distance from global groups and a kind of aversion towards local lifestyle. This has logic when you feel that your country and culture are increasingly considered in the future. Okay, your point. Let me see. The third. Young people. Young people all over the world are being pushed to put themselves first. Students of higher education institutions are exhorted to expect making lots of money and perhaps even to be famous, be famous in a world where good jobs are hard to find and harder to keep. So nowadays, the no so hidden goal of higher education is to develop the basic instincts of competition and in this context, to develop citizenship 
in students and also in faculty and directors of our universities. Demands to drive against the hegemonic forces that are defining and giving meaning what higher education is for and also what global, the term of global means. The question is, are global universities prepared to take this challenge? Are we prepared to drive against <coughs> these forces? The fourth point. There is a tendency in higher education to move away from teaching and studying the humanities. Whatever commitment to universities who want to make contribution to develop citizenship is to bring humanities to their academic programs and careers. But what humanities? I have to say, I have been in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, trying to make local something to this kind there. And uh, the first thing we have to do, do you know the basic program at the University of Chicago? Well, the first thing is uh, to take the great books of all culture. So global, global culture is not about persons or It's about things. It's about ideas. It's about culture. It's bringing great books to a great conversation. So we begin with whatever great author of whatever culture you want. Just talk about Marx. And why don't Marx talk with Kokoshi? Why don't we talk about what kids have called things? Why don't you think Mexico has philosophy? Why don't we have history? Why don't we have our own logic? Why don't we talk about our authors? It's a, it's a time for a great conversation, not only 